If you know me, then you know I love finding deals on cheap tech with an amazing price versus performance ratio. And at $15, this might be the best thing that we're going to look at this year. This tiny board is the Orange Pi Zero 3, and it's packed with a ton of features. In this video, we're going to see how it holds up from a gaming perspective. But before we can do that, let's go over the specs and the pricing. The Orange Pi Zero 3 comes with the all-winner H618 processor with four Cortex-A53 cores clocked at up to 1.5 GHz. For the GPU, we have a Mali G31 MP2 clocked at up to 600 MHz. I'm not sure if this has any 3D drivers for Linux, but in Android, we have OpenGL ES 3.2 and Vulkan 1.1. If I get a chance, I'll poke around in Linux to see if they ship this with Molly drivers. As for the pricing, that's one of the most attractive parts of this product. We have four SKUs on offer, with prices ranging from $14.90 up to $25 for the highest version with 4GB of RAM. These should be the promotional prices, and I don't know how long they will last. I asked the company if these prices would go up, and they couldn't give me an answer. Right now, this is an amazing deal because this is almost the cost of the hardware alone. A few years ago, I made a video about the Orange Pi Zero 2. This little guy was originally sold for $19, but now it's on sale for only $15. There have been a few optimizations made to this newer version, but overall, it's still a great value. I have the original Zero 2 in a case, but I'm going to take it apart so you can see what's inside. The ports on the newer version are basically the same as the older one. There's an Ethernet port, a USB Type-C port for charging and data transfer, a micro HDMI port, and a single USB 2.0 port. Both boards have Wi-Fi, but I removed the cable right now from the new one. Unfortunately, my original Orange Pi Zero 2 is broken right now. I had a screw fall into it and it shorted out the board, but it was one of my favorite products to work with and it was the first board that I ever used to teach my son about electronics. So I was a little bummed the day that it broke, but I never got around to buying another one. Now that I have this new one, he's already got his eye on it. So not only is the Orange Pi Zero 3 cheaper, but they actually managed to make the entire size a bit more compact. I think the unfortunate thing is that it's not compatible with the original case that I have, and they don't have any for sale at this point, so I'm gonna have to run this as is for the time being. Outside of the ports that we've already looked at, we do have a bunch of other important features here. We have a 26-pin GPIO header with a 13-pin expansion interface that you can use with an I.O. adapter that they sell. That will give you two additional USB ports, AV out, and an IR receiver. The other three pins can be used with a serial debugger. Now that we're finished with the overview, it's time to take a look at the software options that we have and to go through the flashing process. When we head over to the product page for this and click on the download link, we can see that there are four operating systems that we can choose from. There are three Linux options with a single Android image. I wanna look at Android since they have a new version this time around, but I will try to look at those other three if I have time. Flashing that Android image to an SD card is not as painless as other devices since you won't be able to use standard tools like Rufus or Etcher. You have to use something called Phoenix card and it's far from perfect. I picked a 64 gigabyte card for this since that's more than enough space for what I wanna do and I tried to flash it following the directions from the user guide. It looked like that was going to work before it froze for a minute or two. After that, it gave a burn failed error message. Looking at the SD card in Disk Manager, we can see that it created the partitions, but the card cannot work. So I decided to try again and it failed again. They say that third time's a charm, so I tried again and it also failed. I then tried a very cheap Chinese SD card and it worked. So I decided to try my SanDisk card again and it failed. Now my SanDisk card is authentic and it passed verification, so I'm not sure what's going on here, but now it's time to boot the Android image. That's a pleasant boot song. Anyway, here's the Android 12 TV image that they have. Not the best in the world, but it should work for what we want to do. They have some apps pre-installed, like Wiring Orange Pi that can be useful depending on your project. I'm more interested in emulation, but this is cool to see. I need to install some stuff on this board right now, and I'm planning to do that over USB. To do that, we need to enable developer options. While I'm here, I like that I see that this is running a user debug build because that's going to make things a bit easier for us later on. Now that I have USB debugging enabled, it's time to start installing apps over ADB. I'll do the rest of this off camera because I do have a lot to do. Now that we've finished the flashing process with Android, the next thing that I want to do is add some passive heatsinks to this. 
I have a whole bunch of these that I bought a few years ago for these kinds of projects. This board doesn't seem to get as hot as I remember my old board getting, but I'm still going to add a few of these to improve things. This time around, I'm going to put a bigger one over the processor and the DDR4 chip, and I'm probably going to put this one over here on the Wi-Fi chip since I'm going to use Wi-Fi most of the time. That should be enough because this processor doesn't consume that much power. It's probably going to use about one to three watts depending on what you're doing. So this should be enough. After playing Tetris with these pieces, this is what we're working with. Not perfect, but it is pretty decent. I could order custom ones that are the exact dimensions of the CPU and RAM chips, but I already feel like this is enough since I had a much smaller heatsink on my older board and that was just fine. As I mentioned earlier, I couldn't flash this on my SanDisk card, but I was able to get it to flash on this OV card, which is kind of surprising, but whatever. So now we've got everything hooked up. I've got my board here with a screen and a Bluetooth controller. All we need to do is plug this in and everything should work. I've already installed a bunch of stuff here and I was originally planning on using a different front end, but Dig is the only one that I could get to work. Ideally, you'd wanna boot into something like this directly and then you'd have a semi emulation station set up going. If we go into these sections, some of these should have box art. I didn't have time to fix any titles that weren't scraped correctly, but this is what we're working with on my Zero 3 at this point. I think it works out pretty well. I like the look of this front end a lot more than others. It's also super easy to work with and it works across a lot of Android versions, so it's a great option to consider. If we wanna play a game, all we have to do is go into it and it should be able to launch correctly. This is the front end that I was planning to use for this video, but I ran into a problem that makes this and a lot of other things impossible to do on the Android 12 TV image. I'll just give you a quick demonstration so you can see what I'm talking about. Say you wanna add your ROMs directory to this. Well, if you go over to the paths option and then you click add, it will just crash out. You would think that this is a problem with the front end, but it's not. And we can find other instances of this in other places. Let's go to redream and let's go over to the library tab and try to add a directory. As you can see, we aren't able to do so because Android 12 TV is crap. This is caused by the storage access framework changes and it's broken like this in every product that I own that can run Android 12 TV. It's busted and it breaks the functionality of a lot of applications. For example, if we go into DuckStation, you can see that I do have games here, but I added these manually to the app's private storage to do so. If I go into the settings and I go over to the games list, I have nothing listed here and I'm also not able to add a new path. The only reason why I have games here is because the developer Stenzek was nice enough to make me a build that created a hard-coded directory to the emulator's private storage. A few other emulators also have workarounds like this in place. Yaba Sanchiro has had something like this for a long time, but other emulators either don't or won't tell you. PPSSPP was unable to read anything that wasn't placed inside the app's private storage, so I had to move all of my games over there with ADB, which was super annoying. If I open up Moopin64, you can see that I have a lot of games here, and again, these are in the app's private storage directory. If I try to refresh the ROMs list, it will say that there is no system file picker detected, and it will give you this path for you to move your files. If you don't do this, you won't be able to use this emulator. Needless to say, I'm not a fan of this Android TV build, and I don't know why Google implemented these storage changes without seeing if they work across all of their Android versions. The only app that won't give you these problems is RA. This is able to read ROMs from the internal storage just fine. The only problem is it doesn't have the best performance for the higher end systems that this chip can emulate. I hope that we get other Android versions going forward because this kind of sucks. Other than that, the system itself is actually pretty snappy. Now, let's start looking at some emulation performance. Our first system is Sega Genesis, which is a super light system for the Zero 3 to emulate. There are a lot of other systems that are under this in terms of demand, but this is where I want to start things. Our next system is Super Nintendo, and we're going to be able to emulate any game that we want, but we will need to switch to some older SNES 9X cores to play heavier titles. When it comes to GBA emulation, we won't have any issues with the MGBA core on the Zero 3.
Now we're on to the bigger systems that have standalone emulators. For Nintendo 64, I'm using the Moopin FZ emulator, and it's handling these titles very well. PlayStation 1 is our next system with the Duck Station emulator. This board can almost do 3x native PS1, but it really depends on the game. I set it to 2x native, which can still be an issue for some games like the battles in Final Fantasy IX. Dreamcast would run much better on this if we were able to use Redream, but that emulator has an issue with the library as I showed earlier. Because of that, we are stuck with the Flycast core, and even though the Zero 3 is doing a decent job, it would be a lot better if we didn't have these storage issues. Our final system is PSP, and this is going to come down to the game that you're playing. I would say that it's almost not worth playing PSP games on this with the current storage issues due to the annoying requirement of having to move huge game files to the private app directory, but that's up to you. I also wanted to look at some Android gaming on this. I started out with Minecraft, but I wasn't able to get this to run without crashing, and I didn't have time to try and diagnose the logs. Thankfully, Doom 3 works, which is not that big of a surprise since it ran on a much weaker all-winner calculator that I made a video about not that long ago. It's still great to see. The Half-Life series runs great on this. Half-Life 1 runs a bit better than 2, but even Half-Life 2 wasn't that bad. This is running at 720p resolution, so I would expect it to run faster if we lowered the resolution a bit. It's sad, but this is running better than it was on my computer when this game first came out. I had some extra time after wrapping up that last section, so I decided to check on the Linux images that they have. The Debian image is good, but it doesn't have hardware acceleration. I don't know if this is due to Orange Pie not adding the blobs to their image, or if Allwinner didn't want to pay ARM for the licensing fee for their drivers. It's really anyone's guess. I also tried the Orange Pie OS build, and this one is very nice to use if you're completely new to Linux. They did a good job on this, and even though it doesn't have GPU acceleration or hardware acceleration, it's a great little option to turn this board into a computer. 
And as a last attempt, I flashed the Ubuntu image, and that one also doesn't have any GPU drivers. I believe this GPU is supported by Panfrost right now, but that's a little more work than I want to do right now to get that off the ground. It would be good to have at least a binary blob for this chip, because software rendering takes a lot of processing power off the top. But that's going to wrap up things for this showcase on the Orange Pi Zero 3. Depending on what you want to do, this could be a great option to consider, especially given how cheap it is. If a normal Android version is ever ported to this, or an earlier TV build ever comes out, it will be an even better deal. I'll have links to the Orange Pi store down below if you want to buy one for yourself. If you enjoyed this video and you want to see another, feel free to take a look at a video that I did on a $10 all-winner calculator that I bought. That thing is still the best deal that I've ever found. Happy gaming, everyone. Talkie out.